these live streams over the last two months now. And uh, I'm just turning off my Wi-Fi here. Uh, it's been a really great pleasure to be spending time with you all and to go over some of these topics. I've been really uh, taken back by some lovely comments that have come through, people thanking uh, me and of course Nikki and Dave are contributing during this time, which is unusual, uh, and just you know making making the times maybe a bit more enjoyable, a bit more uh, interesting, something to look forward to. So I, I'm very grateful for you for coming to watch. I'm grateful for Nikki and Dave for being such a great team, and for Evita being a great wife. And uh, it's really just a very um, privileged place to be. So thank you for joining me, and thank you for being on all of these sessions. Um, please do say hello in the comments and the, oh, it's always good to know if you can hear me and see me although these days I feel that I'll probably get a blast of uh, messages uh, quite quickly if I if I don't hear that so uh, today we will be talking about some right hand techniques I have been doing some coaching calls uh, at the Academy and a couple of these techniques came into discussion uh, in some of the coaching calls and I thought I would share them with you. They're very, um, I, I very much think of them as if we were painters, let's say, then we are looking for different brush strokes, different ways to wield the paint so that we can create different effects. And it's very much the same thing in the right hand. We want to have some different techniques so that we can bring our musical ideas to life. Um, Nikki, Dave and I were on a call just this morning and, uh, I believe it was Dave who was quoting uh, um, Dave. Have, it's it's Ben Seacher Bernstein. Uh, Dave, you'll have to put in the comments. I can't remember right now. Um, oh, it's it's gone for me. But um, uh, he said, "Eavesdrop on your own musical intuition." Why am I? Seymour, Seymour Bernstein. That's right. He actually had a document. He's a piano player, and he had a documentary made about him by Ethan Hawke, not no, no less. So, uh, really, uh, we we want our technique to be able to transmit, try not communicate our musical ideas as best we can. So that's why we have all these different brush strokes that we can use with our right hand, and that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at seven different right hand approaches and some of them have some little variants in there so you might get even more than seven so let's have a look at the comments and say hello to everyone hey Stephen from Colorado uh Jeff uh Jeff I got your your piece of mail it's very very kind of you I'll, I'll be in touch soon about that um Jose Luis all the way from Brooklyn hello James Martin great to see everyone uh, Brent's in there, and a lot of people here uh, who have been coming every session. I really appreciate that. It feels like kind of a one. It feels like a get together of our friends, but also it feels like a little bit of a show, a little bit of something to uh, look forward to. So I, I the um, the regularity of it, I think, is is really quite nice. Francois, great to see you. Francois was at uh, our Gotoberfest in New York. Miles. Great to hear from you, Miles. Hope you're well. Um, all right, John from upstate. Maybe you're up in the Berkshires. I don't know. Um, Jacques, bonjour. That's my. This is this is as good as I can do for French. Uh, Marcos from Brazil. Lovely to uh, see you. Well, to see your text. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Hey, Nikki's in there, saying hello to everyone. So wonderful to see everyone. So as I said, today we're going to be talking about seven different right-hand techniques. I feel like it's a little bit, little, little bit of a countdown. Let me just get my notes ready. A little bit of organization never goes astray. And uh, I might even use a little bit of a different camera setup today because we are... Before we get started and while I'm, I'm tuning, I'd be interested, all these people uh, commenting, can you think, before we dive into some of these, can you think of some of the different types of right hand techniques that we uh, employ as players 
to create different effects and sounds to bring out melodies um, and maybe write some of those in the comments. comments coming in. All right, so someone said uh, staccato. Staccato is an interesting one because you can actually do right hand and left hand. Let me see if I can actually, is this going to work? There's my right hand. I will bring up uh, a bigger image of my right hand. I'm actually going to swap this. So I'm little and the hand, uh, the right hand is big. So we've got red stroke, oh, palm mute from Francois, absolutely. Ponticello, tasto, wrist angle, yes. Raschiato from Judy. Gary says hello. Hi, Gary. That's uh, that's Gary Lee, Lucia Extraordinaire, all the way from New Jersey. So maybe everyone uh, in the chat. But Gary, if you wanted to see some more comments, probably pop over to the YouTube channel. That's sort of where everyone lives and is commenting. Uh, but many people know Gary. He did a wonderful course on uh, the instrument of the guitar. And so it'd be nice for you to Gary to say hello over in the YouTube comments. He's on Facebook at the moment. Top stroke. Oh, Kerry, Kerry is uh, giving away one of the secrets. Not the secret, but uh, definitely one of the topics I want to talk about today. Pizzicato. Yes, absolutely. It's sort of pizzicato is a, a term that comes from violin, the string playing that, uh, you know, is plucked to pluck the string. And so technically in that regard, we're always playing pizzicato. But uh, what we often think of pits is either that, which is that's actually Bartok pizzicato, where uh, we lift, bring the string up and let it slap back against the uh, fretboard to make that kind of percussive sound. Or sometimes people think of pits as that sound, which is a different one, a different technique which we will talk about. Flesh stroke, yes, using the flesh of the fingers instead of the nails, yes. Uh, right hand rolls, rolling chords. Yes, so, so there's a lot. Right hand bass stopping, Jeff talked about. Um, so um, yeah, lots of different right hand. As you can see, there's actually a lot of things we can use at our disposal to really make our music come to life. So let's get started. I think I think we let's let's try this one. Mm. I suppose so. Yeah. All right. All right. So, oh, it's not a bit better. Um, the first technique I'd like to introduce is, and pardon me if I'm creating some names here because they don't all have names, but I'm going to call this the double rest stroke. So many of you know about the rest stroke, where we have the finger simply uh, play one string and come to rest on the adjacent string. The virtue of this movement is that we can push the sound a little bit and it can make a nice strong sound, uh, usually a bit stronger than free stroke, although we can really match the sounds if either we make our free stroke a bit more robust or if we make uh, the rest stroke a little more subtle. So we can match them, they don't have to be different. But there is an inherent difference between the rest stroke and the free stroke, and sometimes you want to use that to our advantage. So when I say double rest stroke, what I mean is that we can play a rest stroke, and then the finger is actually on the adjacent string already, so we can use it again. And this particular situation or example came up uh, when I was talking to Jeff, one of our members at the Academy, and we were working on Barrios's uh, Prelude in C minor. And it's, I don't really play this piece, but I'll just play a little bit of it. Okay, so that piece, has a really lilting 
melodic figure up the top. And I asked Jeff to play it so that this note, the A, and then the G stood out, but not only stood out, it also had a difference between the A and the G, so it was leaning. So the G needs to be a lot softer. They were about the same thing. So you can do that with free stroke, and the fingering here is I, oh sorry, P, I, A, M, A, I. However, Jeff was having a little bit of trouble with that and finding it difficult to make that transition to a softer A, to control that A. So I suggested, why don't we use this double rest stroke, and there we get the benefit of the rest stroke being a bit of a heavier, a stroke that we naturally get a bit of an impulse on that first note and we use go back to a free stroke on the uh, G. I'm going to come back to my screen so I can see what I'm showing. All right, so I'm actually going P, I, rest M, free M. want to try that yourself. I'll give you a couple of other examples where it can be quite nice. I'm gonna, here we go. Uh, I, I quite like it in another Barrios piece, uh, La Catedral, the Cathedral. So this is the first Saudage, and watch the double rest stroke, the first double, yeah, I guess what's called, what am I calling it? Double rest stroke. Rest, free, rest, right? So it can be really a wonderful way of bringing out a melody and you're, you're using the technique to your advantage. I'll give you one more, mm, uh, one more example. So maybe, maybe, maybe two from both, no, the first one, we don't know who it's from. <laughs> so we have. all-time great classic hits of classical guitar. And uh, here we, yes, we have repeated notes, but they're not all equal. You know, the melody, it shouldn't be all even and level. Rather, we have a little bit of emphasis on different notes depending on how we want to shape it. And we can use this kind of technique to uh, to our advantage because it's going to have a little bit of strength to it. So, right? I'm, I'm over exaggerating a little bit, um, but uh, maybe you don't want to use it every single measure. Maybe it's just uh, on a really expressive note. And the last example I'll give is just uh, Tarragas study in E minor. Right, I'm using it right on the on the rest. Uh, sorry, on the uh, in in the middle of the suspension. There we've got G preparation of the suspension, suspension, and then back to free stroke at the resolution. So we're using that. Um, to our advantage. So hopefully that, that makes sense there, and I hope, hope that um, right-hand viewpoint is, is working for you. So, um, that's what I'm calling the double rest stroke, although it's a, maybe, maybe you can come up with a better name for it, because double rest stroke implies that there might be two rest strokes, but really it's a rest stroke followed by a free stroke with the same finger. Okay, that is number one. How are we doing on time? Pretty good, pretty good. All right. The next right hand technique I would like to talk about is something that I noticed uh, Marchandilla 
doing in one of his concerts. He's such a phenomenal artist of the guitar. Very, very, if anyone uh, out there had to have the name poet of the guitar, I think it might be Martin Della. He's a fantastic player and he's nuanced playing and uh, very thoughtful and uh, it's, a, it's a very beautiful musician. So I noticed that in some of his chords, he was not so much strumming with the thumb, although of course that is one of our most common ways to strum a chord. He was actually holding his uh, index finger, reinforcing it with the thumb and playing with the back of his nail. This gives quite a different sound and I think it's really nice for controlling the upper voices. Now, just to show you how I do it, it's really, um, I kind of bring my other three fingers in and I almost as if I'm just pinching something very fine, like a thread, right? So, and then the thumb remains behind the index finger so that you push with the thumb, it's reinforcing that finger and you get a stiff uh, eye finger there and it's, it's like using a pick almost. Let's go back and have a look. So here's the thumb, obviously. And here's the nail. I guess maybe I don't maybe I don't bring my fingers in all the time. All right. So let's look at it in action. from Villalobos Prelude number one. And there are some other benefits to this because this, watch, watch where my M and I fingers are at the end of this chord. They're very much in the position to play again, whereas thumb, uh, you know, your hand is quite in a different position. So it might be nice if you need to get back in position quite quickly. Uh, this can be a really useful uh, uh, chord, str uh, chord strum to use. I'll give you another example. Hopefully this won't uh, peak the audio too much, but this is the chords later in that section from the same piece. So... Similar in that we need to come back quite quickly to play, right? So your eye finger is quite uh, readily available. Also, let's say if we use the thumb, we tend to get a bit more of a bass heavy sound. We can, of course, if we really overextend, try and get those top strings. But we really have to, I have to turn my wrist and uh, bring it all the way down. So. So here's the, that is the second right hand technique that I wanted to talk about uh, where we're playing with the back of the nail. I suppose it could work with other fingers, but I haven't tried it to be honest. Um, of course, some of these techniques might be familiar to you. And uh, I see that Marco says, I call it swiping stroke. I call double stroke when playing, for example, open G and open E strings with the rest on both I fingers and A. Oh, okay. Oh, swipe it so that Marco's talking about the double rest stroke, swiping stroke. So maybe we can, uh, there can be a little bit of a challenge in the, in the comments to come up with some names of this. Uh, really, we just want names that are obvious and descriptive. Uh, so that was the back of the nail strum. That was number two. Now we're going to now come up to uh, the third one, which has some different parts and this, is uh, this is a very common one, so you may know it already. Uh, this is about right hand harmonics. So the most common way for people to play harmonics is to hold down the nodal point, which is the, the place on the string where we need to hold it down so the string vibrates and uh, in the case of natural harmonics into even sections. And then we need to play the strings. So we need to hold it down with one right hand. This is uh, for artificial harmonics, by the way, or natural harmonics, but usually with uh, natural harmonics, we can deploy the left hand to play the nodal point and the right hand just plays the strings. But when it comes to artificial harmonics, we're holding down a note 
So we have to uh, hold it down with the left hand and that means all of the, the nodal uh, point holding and the plucking has to happen in the right hand. So uh, I'm going to hold it down with my index finger and play it with the A finger. Let's have a look at that. All right, so I'll play it here, which is on the 19th fret, uh, just because it's uh, easier for you to see on the screen, right? So I hold it down, and you play it really very accurate with your finger placement. It has to be right on there. And then what we're looking for, I'm going to bring my second finger in so you can see it. I'm actually playing with the A finger, right? Now, one of the keys to this is that if the more distance you can get between your A finger and your nodal point, the easier it will be out to make a clear note. Also lifting up the finger with the timing, good timing, so you're not leaving it on the string, otherwise it'll sound dull. And also one of the counterintuitive things with uh, harmonics is if you make a very bright, sharp sound, which would normally be kind of maybe a special effect when we're playing uh, guitar normally, when we play harmonics with that bright sound, it actually comes across as a very clear sound. I, I'm using my A finger in this strange position because I want to imitate using this. Uh, right? So that's actually the most obvious and common way. Now, another way is you can put your finger up, your right hand finger, or left hand if you're left handed, and say, oh, I have an idea. And from there, you bring out your thumb to make an L shape. <laughs> uh, and we're going to hold down the nodal point here on the pad of the finger, and we're going to use the thumb to play the string. Now this is really good for bass strings because the thumb doesn't get a scratchy sound on the bass strings, and you can actually get a lot of distance. So let's have a look at that one. Right, so once again, I'll play, yeah, I'll play way up here because um, you can see it. But then there's a nodal point here on the 19th fret. And this is what it sounds like if I use my A finger. Yeah, it's a little scratchy. It's not particularly clear, but if I use this sort of pointer finger with a thumb, very different sound. Quite a nice sound, I think. Um, so I, I prefer, Much prefer using this on the bass strings. Now let me see if I can move around a little bit. Okay, yes. So let me see, I'll give you an example of changing. Right, so I can change actually, and it's not too difficult, but I prefer using the thumb there for the bass strings. Now I'm gonna tell you a, a third one, which I, had never have never used and uh, but uh, our star member Linda Tsardakis from Germany uh, has been playing El Sueño de la Muñequita, the Barrios piece, and that has quite a substantial harmonic section. And she's been using a technique where she holds down the nodal point on the side of her thumb here, a very bony part, so I suppose it's good for a small surface area, and then playing it with the eye finger. Now. The, the jury is still out uh, on this one. And for me, it doesn't, uh, is it a lot of open string sound you can kind of get, or, or the fundamental note, if that's the right term. But that sounds like this. Now what Linda liked about this, so I'm actually, it's kind of hard to see, but I'm, I'm touching the nodal point in that, that part of the thumb. And then as you can see pretty clearly, I'm playing. Now what she did, what she liked about it is that she had to play chords as well, right? And that position had her right hand already close to being to playing those notes, uh, so you didn't have to change so much. So uh, Linda likes it, so I'm going to call those Linda natural uh, Linda harmonics because she came up with it and she showed it to me. Uh, now the last one is a just something of interest, I think, perhaps. And that is, uh, if you've ever seen one of these pieces where uh, there's harmonics and chords being played at the same time. So, right, this is the 
second bagatelle from William Walton's Bagatelles, beautiful pieces. Uh, and he actually, mm -hmm. he's actually asking, and of course I'll show you the right hand, he's actually asking the player to play a bass note, two normal notes, and then one artificial harmonic. And so it's quite, um, it is quite a tricky, but very, it's in the end manageable. So we've got the bass and then these two notes here, which are, uh, let's say normal notes, normally played notes. And then we have a harmonic, right? So the harmonic needs to be played as we do with I and A. Uh, what am I doing here? Oh yes, the thumb comes to play the third string, second finger plays the second string. Every, every finger has a job here. I'm just making up notes there, but you get the idea. So that one I thought would just be a little bit of interest uh, to you because it's an interesting use of the hand. And it's, I think it's quite amazing that William Walton, not a guitarist at all, worked with Julian Bream uh, and, and used this really uh, pretty complex technique to great musical effect. Now I'm going to take just a moment to uh, answer some questions because we have, what are we up to now? One, two, three, we're kind of at the midway point, I would say, of uh, our techniques. And we're at midway through the hour. Man, my timing must be getting better. So uh, let's have, uh, listen, I saw some questions coming in. So, Kerry asked, does the stiffness of the first finger knuckle come, joint come into it? Hmm, tricky because I'm not 100% sure which. I think you were talking about the first one, the rest stroke. I believe so. Maybe you can ask your question again, Kerry. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, Antonio was talking about the camera angle. This angle is deceiving. Do you hold your guitar with the neck pointing forward away from your shoulder or backwards close to your shoulder? I imagine, yes, I can understand why the, the camera angle would be deceptive. It's parallel to my shoulders, more or less. It's definitely not backwards. But yes, I can imagine the camera angles are doing all sorts of weird things. Um, Samuel, Samuel asked, uh, should an effort be made to match the timbre between the back of the nail and the regularly picked AMI? In, and so this, we're talking about um, this strumming technique. I would say no. I mean, once again, we're talking about techniques that can give us a musical variety and expressive means. And so that we want to sometimes enhance their individuality. We don't want them to sound, you don't want to necessarily make one thing match the other. I did talk about having free strokes being able to match rest strokes. And of course, it's good to be able to play strong and robust or light and airy with both strokes. However, uh, we don't always need to equivocate uh, or make, make um, things the same. We actually want to probably highlight the differences in some instances. and. In many cases, we're aiming to use the natural tendency of a technique to our musical advantage. That's, so when the rest stroke can be very light and easy, but it tends to have a little bit of a push compared to a free stroke. So we're using it to our advantage. Um, Matthew said, uh, or asked, is it bad that I use this almost pick technique almost whenever there's a chord strum, divise prelude at the moment? It's an interesting question. Um, I mean, nothing's bad. Uh, we're playing the guitar. Everything, everything is on a spectrum of good, really. <laughs> uh, so, no, I wouldn't say it's bad. I would say it's it's a little unusual to play all of them like that, but only unusual to me. Uh, 
th for instance, that right there, you've got the fifth string, the thumb, no fourth string, and then a chord. So there, I really would want to have uh, P, A, M, I using individually. Like if you, I guess if you held down a full a bar A there and got the E in. You know, in the end, I, I think a masterclass with Zoran Dukic uh, several months ago, last year it was, um, someone asked a question about technique, should I use this, should I use that? And he just sort of gave this answer of, whatever works. So the, the music is first, and then whatever gets you to your point of expression, um, if it works, then it works. So you don't have to question it too much. As, as I said, there's no real wrong here. So uh, if that's working for you and it's making good musical result, that's great. Uh, Chad said, the grand stroke. Uh, <laughs> I like it. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, Harry Joseph put it, gave a really interesting point about, we're talking about the double rare stroke or what, we, I, the grand stroke. I do like that name. Uh, Harry said, you can also use this for mordants across two adjacent strings uh, by using rest stroke A on the higher string, free stroke A on the lower string. Oh, yes. You know, okay, I'm going to take that one further, Harry. Here, here we get a bonus right-hand technique. Um, so Harry's saying a mordant, you know, is uh, and then silence in the other string then. I mean, so I think maybe maybe like a grace note you might be talking about or a chakatura, uh, that kind of thing, uh, where you can and then silencing the string. What I was going to reference is actually there's a kind of trill. Only a brief one you can do by going two of these in succession. Have a listen to this. There it is. I mean, if you get the timing right, it can sound quite effective. So yet another little interesting tidbit. Thank you, uh, Harry, for pointing that out. Um, Linda harmonics work nicely for the last harmonic in birds uh, flew over the spire. Good to know. We should write to uh, Gary Ryan. So, um, great, all right. Uh, Michelangelo said, who I believe is in Egypt, so hello, uh, Michelangelo. Simon, what do you think about using the little finger for artificial harmonics rather than the third? All right, so I think Michelangelo is asking about plucking with that. For me, I, I, I yeah, I think I've seen it. It's obviously a big distance. Um, you'd have to make sure you get work on your nail a little bit. Sometimes I neglect this pinky nail because it's kind of come what may. There's, I don't actually polish it very often. Um, so I'd have to pay attention to that. And it's less in control for me personally, but I can see it working. It's possible. Um, Twin Jet Nebula asked, how do you make artificial harmonics louder? Well, I think that's all to do with the accuracy of positioning, obviously you want to play quite loudly with your stroke. I think that sort of sharper tone angle that I talked about will help as well, and also good timing. Uh, a lot of those elements will make it sort of the note bloom, if you will, as opposed to get stifled. So, uh, you know, it's you play them loudly just as you would a normal note by putting force into the string, energy into the string, but a lot of times the projection of them has to do with how accurate your placement is of both hands, and then also your timing of lifting the finger. But know also that harmonics tend to carry very well through a guitar texture, so you don't necessarily have to push them too much. Um, Mark's got an interesting suggestion. Apotirando, sounds nice, apotirando. Sounds like something I might order at a coffee shop. Um, and then Linda said, goodness, I went back to listen and talk. <laughs> yes, yes, you, it's your technique. Well, you came up with it, Linda. Uh, so it's, a, it's out there with your name on it. <laughs> All right, well, that's the end of the questions that I noted. Uh, feel free to add them in again, especially we'll have some questions at the end as well. But let me now go through the next four, sort of the second half of this. So uh, Kerry Conroy knows this one very well. Uh, the next technique I want to talk about is etouffee, sometimes called palm muting in other uh, guitar worlds, and or sometimes also known as 
pizzicato because we're sort of associating that sound. And what we're doing here is, uh, well, and also I want to talk about pushing this a little bit further. So if you know this already, stay with me. So this has to do with muting the strings with your side of your palm, hence the name palm muting. So we don't get a normal note. We don't get a dead note like that, but we get some pitch as well. So it's a mixture and you can control that mixture uh, by how much flesh is on the string. So that's a little palette of color there, right? And um, you can also do a, a really interesting variation where you, you control the angle of your hands so that you're getting the string, but then you have other ones open. So this kind of like, it really has that effect of two instruments. You've got a pits double bass and then some other instrument. Um, so that's that technique. I think, you know, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, it can be, uh, take some time to learn to wield it. But what I wanted to talk about was what I'm going to call bream etouffe. So uh, I didn't have it lined up and I don't have the book here, but what I would suggest you listen to is Bream's version or recording of La Maja de Goya. It's a piece by um, Enrique Granados. It's one of my all-time favorite recordings of Bream. And he's got an etouffee at the beginning of that. That's, yes, it's an etouffee just like we talked about, but he pushes the string in a way that you get a bit of slap. And we talked about Bartok Pitts at the beginning, but that's extra kind of raz, if you like, out on the, on the note, at that buzz. Uh, is because it's hitting, we're pulling it up so much that we're hitting the fret. And so if we do that kind of over activation of the string, we also get a pretty great sound that we can use. Oh man, do I have the music? I had the music out yesterday for La Maja de Goya, but uh, that's the first notes I think. a sound that we might not want but you know uh, as sometimes uh, I think I heard I'm paraphrasing Oscar Gillia in the, his Siena masterclass saying if everything is beautiful then nothing is beautiful okay, it's, a, it's a great effect so really kind of pushing into the guitar getting a little bit of distortion on your etouffee so that's what I'm going to call the Bream etouffee because I really love the way he does it in those pieces. I also find it in, um, he does it in the Bagatelles. Uh, where is it? Yeah, so it's marked pits in this. Um, yeah. Yeah. But you get the idea, right? So I'm just putting a bit of oomph into those uh, etouffees and pizzicatos to get that extra kind of sound. So that was number one, two, three, four on the list. Now, this is another one that uh, Kerry Conroy mentioned at the beginning. Uh, this is the top stroke, staying in Bream land. Uh, this is something that I learned about from Fred Hand, who studied, who's one of the very few people who studied for an extended period of time with Julian Bream. Uh, also, Laura Snowden, who came and did a masterclass for CGC on, she did Carcassi, uh, Villalobos, uh, Prize 3 and 4. She also has worked with Julian Bream quite a lot. And she acknowledged this term that, uh, that Fred taught me about. And this is the idea of a top stroke. Now we have our free stroke. Let's pick a nice note here. Let's just say this, right? Free stroke, and of course our rest stroke. But he talked about a top stroke. You can see I'm sliding, I'm, I'm keeping my index finger quite uh, straight, if not, 
It's not rigid. And I'm sliding across the nail. Now I think part of the virtue of this is that because we're dropping our wrist down a little bit to go across the string, we're actually reaching up towards a very mellow part of the tone uh, world and getting close to the nodal point. We're about to talk about that in a second. So you get a very particular bell-like sound. And you can see I'm just sliding. I'm actually, if you look at my forearm, I'm using the whole of my arm. I'm not keeping it in the finger. I'm using my arm. Let me find an example. Uh, let me see. All right, like maybe that. I'm just, I'm just sort of picking a random note. I'm sliding my finger. You'll actually see me do this quite a lot if you look at my video, uh, right hand in video. Sliding it across instead of back. Much me more mellow sound. Okay, it's a very beautiful. So this is a top stroke coming from uh, Fred Hand, who is a beautiful tonal player. And of course, the great master himself, Julian Bream. So uh, it's a really interesting stroke to play around with. Uh, and explore, and I, I will use it very often. Um, I'm trying to think of some other examples. Well, even let's say uh, we talked about, yeah, this is a good example. I talked about the beginning of La Cathedral, right? Uh, you can, and we'll, well, actually we'll, we'll tie this together and after the next point, but you can, if I'm gonna do that double uh, rest stroke or the AKA the grand stroke, <laughs> Notice the movement of my finger. Uh. I'm not actually going. Straight back, I'm sliding across. That's a top stroke. And that's a really beautiful effect. And now we will come full circle. So I'm going to talk about playing on the nodal point. So this is going to bring together, well, in that particular case, we're going to bring together the, the double rest stroke, the top stroke and nodal point playing. Now, if you're wondering what a nodal point is, we use it for harmonics. So uh, it's a place where we divide the string equally into sort of mathematical division. The most common obvious one is the 12th fret, dividing the string into two parts. If you want to really have a bit of nerdy fun on the guitar, you can hold down the nodal point playing the harmonic here, the 12th fret, and really play the string loudly. Look at this part of the string and that part of the string and they're vibrating. And look at the 12th fret on the nodal point and it's still. So you've got the string vibrating in two sections. And as we move it to different nodal points, it divides up into thirds and fifths and on we go until we get complex ones. Um, so we, we use those to play our harmonics and the, the most robust one is at the octave, right? So if we don't necessarily play a harmonic, but rather we play a normal note, but move our right hand all the way to that nodal point, we'll get a very special sound. Fernando Saw used to call this bassoon tone. So if I take my thumb, I'm going to play it on the 12th fret, not either side of the fret, but right over the fret. That is a very special tone. Huh. It's like a gong, right? I use it, if you, if you want to listen to me play it on a, a piece, I use it at the beginning of Constellations by Armin Koch on the B flat. bring my hand all the way up here and you'll notice this in some play uh, performances. Now if you want to take it one step further you follow the nodal point as you change notes. So if the, the melody goes I hope you can see it. Let's, let's change to the hand, the right hand. Mm. <laughs> Neither of them are particularly good. I'm going to drop my guitar down so you can see this. So I'm following my left hand position as, as I would if I was playing 
natural harmonics. So it's the same concept. Uh, now that that's I'm playing sort of at the octave there. A really obvious one on the B, for instance. The nice thing about playing note, uh, on the note point six with these high notes is that uh, we can easily we don't have to go so far up the fretboard to find them. There's the harmonic, the octave, and I can find the nodal point right there on the 19th fret. And still we can follow it. So I, I promised you that we would tie in the three last techniques. Right? There's that special note we want to feature, or maybe it's this actually. Who knows, whatever you decide. But what I'm doing is a top stroke, and I'm playing on the nodal point, combining those two techniques. And now, for my last act, <laughs> uh, the note finale. There's a nodal point. Here's my grand stroke, the double uh, <laughs> rest stroke, and top stroke. following it's very small distances up here but I'm using all those three techniques to make this music just ethereal that the saudage at the beginning of the uh, the cathedral so I'm using Julian Bream's top stroke I'm playing right over the nodal point and I'm using this double rest stroke to get the benefit of a that rest stroke sound so it's a wonderful uh, uh, example there of using all these different techniques to bring things out Okay, the last one, number seven, and then I'll take some questions. Uh, yes, the last one is actually, the last technique is the one that inspired this session, and that is the double thumb stroke. So we talked about the, the double rest stroke. Now I want to mention the double thumb stroke. And this is used quite commonly out of, yeah, it's a very common stroke. So let's say we've got... This is the second half of Maria Luisa, right? right? And in this piece, uh, we had a very distinct upper part, very clean melody up nice and high. But then in the second half, we get this melody that comes in on the fourth string. Right? And to bring that out, if you play it with just P, I, and M like normal, you're asking the I finger to play on a bass string, which is not great for that kind of sound, the swish sound. And it's also, you're competing with a thumb, which is naturally a little louder. So what I would like to encourage you to do is to, you might have to change your hand position and bring the, the wrist over, but I'm gonna go through both strings and play through and try and play louder on the second of the two. I might even, I'm splitting them a little bit. we can get that lovely thick robust sound of the thumb another wonderful example of course is so using that and it's, it's definitely a technique that's going to be very very useful to bring out those inner lines I mean this isn't an example of it but it is an example of using the natural weight of the thumb to bring out a melody is what I'm doing. Uh, what is it? I'm doing an arpeggio and then the last note in that arpeggio. Of course on the piano it's just in within the chord but this is Granada. Another example, not the same, not a double, double thumb, but I'm using it as an example of where we're using the thumb to really make it clear what the melody is. So that double thumb is very, very useful for bringing out inner voices and especially on those bass strings. All righty. Do we have any questions? That, that, is not, that was number seven. So number one was this double rest stroke. Number two was the back of the nail strum. 
number three was the different right hand harmonics, uh, number four was the Etouffee a la Bream. Number five was the top stroke, also from Bream. Uh, nodal points was number six, playing on the nodal points. And then the double thumb was uh, the last point, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, from number seven. So I, I hope you enjoyed those. I, I think, I hope that they, uh, if not, at least, I hope there was at least one that uh, piqued your interest or was a different way that you're used to um, or maybe maybe there's some just brand new ideas in there so um, let's have a look at some questions okay Nikki was saying we we're talking about this bassoon tone playing over the nodal point she's saying that in Italian they call it the clarinet sound so um, there's a there's a very I know in the clarinet, maybe this isn't what it uh, be referring to, but in the clarinet, there's a sound, a range called the shalamo. Shalamé? Shalamo. Shalamo, I think. It's just, again, this kind of very uh, gong-like, warm, robust sound. And I wonder if the clarinet can get that kind of same uh, sound. Um, if anyone wants the science bit for playing over the nodal points, it sounds different because you... Yes, you only have the fundamental frequency and odd numbers harmonics in the way. That's right, yes. Uh, I remember many years ago on CGC, I did a video where I said that there were more notes in the harmonic series in, in that note, and that's why it sounded richer. But it was the entirely the opposite. is because it, just, it has fewer overtones, I think, and more of the fundamental. That's why you get that special sound. And of course, the internet let me know that I was incorrect. <laughs> um, um, oh, Martha liked the presentation today. I'm glad you did, Martha. Uh, oh, Carlos asked, what kind of strings do I use? At the moment, very old ones. <laughs> These have these have not been changed in far too long just because I haven't had concerts. I normally change my strings for concerts. Uh, but in answer to your question, uh, I use Daddario J46, just straight up. Uh, oh, actually, hang on. What am I talking about? I use Daddario on J46 on this guitar because it's very bright. It's spruce. And so the, the standard nylon uh, I help balance that out. On the Cedar guitar, I use Dynacore. So I think they have the titanium troubles. Uh, yeah, so I, I really like those strings. Um, great, people have been looking forward to using some things in practice. And John found that the top stroke was new for John. Oh, that's awesome. Um, is tapping done on the classical guitar, hammering on? Sure. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of there are some people, I mean, I know Thibaut Kavan played a piece he wrote himself that has tapping. I think Stephanie Jones may have had some pieces where she's done some tapping. I mean, it works. It's not, tapping on the electric and steel string acoustics is a little more effective. Well, if you want, there is a piece by um, Yobet Variations uh, that actually, I guess that's not tapping, what am I talking about? But if you're talking about tapping like, Maybe it doesn't work exactly the same as uh, electric, you know, it's not as effective, but maybe things like that, like percussive effects or just left hand alone. Yes, absolutely they work, but uh, maybe it's maybe a little bit differently. They're just not as resonant as you'll find on other strings. Um, Chad said, um, pinch stroke, pushing down with the thumb and free stroke. Pushing down with the thumb and free stroking the I, M, A in quick succession. I'm not familiar with that. I'm not sure what that is. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe on another on a coaching call you can show me. Um... Ahmed said he has a problem with the position of the right hand. That might be a little bit out of the scope of this uh, 
this uh, session here to go in fact setting up the right hand. So I'm sorry I can't help you there, Ahmed. Uh, maybe on another session we uh, we can do something. There's definitely there are some um, there's definitely some right hand videos on the channel, I believe. Dave was saying that he hasn't uh, changed his string. <laughs> he hasn't uh, changed his strings for a while. Um, slug tug, okay. Sorry, there was a name in there for some tapping. Well, that seems like the end of the question. So, uh, well, I hope you enjoyed this session. Oh, look at that, 4.58 p.m. I think that's very, I'm happy to be so on time. I'm uh, a little more awake today, as you can see, than last time. Last time I was struggling, and I really, I appreciate very much of some kind people that emailed in asking after them. One of them was my mom. <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate people being uh, thoughtful and kind. And yes, just like all of you, um, Evita and I have our up days and down days, and sometimes you beat the lockdown and sometimes the lockdown beats you. Uh, so that was last Thursday was just a bit of a day where I wasn't on top of it, but we persevere, don't we? So um, thanks, James. Uh, Linda, didn't Terrier compose a piece with the section play just with the left hand because the music box? Yeah, it's um, Danza Mora, I think. Yes, but there's there's a music box piece, music box piece, and in fact, I think that's the Nokia theme that they have. You know, there's, there's a piece by Tariga. The Nokia theme, I don't know, obviously the backstory, but it's ex it, note for note, it's the same in a piece by Tariga. So, and that's is that music box. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of tapping pieces. Benga Beat, yes, absolutely. Yeah, Benga Beat by Gary Ryan is a wonderful piece. Uh, <laughs> lots of thanks. Thank you uh, very much. Alborada. Yes, I'm good. Yeah, that's Al Alborada's a music box. You're right, Mark. Thank you. Um, oh, yes. Oh, really, Brent? That's You haven't come across March and Dilla? one of the great players and he's still he's very young he's sort of my age i don't know he'd be around 40 i think um yeah oh, then, oh i'm getting them all mixed up dave said the nokia theme is from the grand boss by tariga thank you <laughs> so i got them all mixed up so dan's and more is probably just something else maybe that's the one with the left hand section alborada is the music box and then the grand boss is the Nokia theme. I, I was all over the map. So, well, thank you everyone for saying thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, it's Tuesday, so I'll see you again in two days. We'll have more on the CGC show. What I will talk about, I do not know. I might ask, I really would like to get another guest on. Um, maybe actually last last couple of minutes, seeing as we kind of finished early, um, who would you like me to bring on the channel? It's it's relatively easy uh, as long as they answer my phone call, so to speak, because um, we just do it via internet. So maybe who, who would you like to have come on and chat? And what would you like them to chat about? Someone while, while you're thinking about that, maybe someone just asked a little question about Campanello, which is a beautiful sort of right and left hand technique. And that's where we, Campanella, as Nikki will tell you, means bells in Italian. So we play an E and we hold down the D, play the D and the hold down the C, and we let them all ring over. Right? Instead of going on one string, which just keeps the notes um, from ringing over one another. actually finger a lot of things in campanella fingering to let them ring over each other and they get that kind of carillon or bell type sound. <laughs> oh great. All right. I <laughs> oh man. So I asked who uh, who should come on the live stream and I get Julian Bream, Christopher Parkening, David Russell. <laughs> I'm like I don't I don't know if I can pull that much clout. I do have a David Russell uh, podcast coming out soon, 
Um, Christopher Parkening, I've never met, um, uh, but uh, I've, I've seen him. He's got a wonderful speech he gave on the 92nd Street Y, very um, charismatic speaker. Julian Bream, I would love to uh, talk to one day. I got to shake his hand one day, and that was one of the great memories of my guitar life. Um, I'll tell the story some other time, but um, I don't... I don't know if I want to bother him. I don't think he would want to. So I, I, I haven't pursued that because I don't think... After having talk, talked with Fred, because who studied with him, um, I just don't want to push that. But maybe one day I'll get an introduction uh, that comes naturally, and then you never know. Um, oh, thanks, Jenny. Jenny said uh, that th these sessions are an important part of her lockdown. I'm glad. I'm glad that I I also find these energizing and fun, and I look forward to them. Albeit a little bit of a scramble prior. Uh, Stephen Laura Snowden is actually on the podcast. Although I mean, it would be nice to have her come and talk here. I, I suppose, um, but she's on the podcast, and and of course we had the live session uh, in the academy with her. Goha, yeah. Well, we had Hans. We had Goha a few weeks ago. If you want to look back at the channel, Paul Galbraith. That's a great idea. I met him once. I love his music. Love his music. We used to, my roommates when we were in undergraduate used to, um, uh, when he played with the Brazilian guitar quartet, we used to have the, the CD player and we would mark the minutes and seconds where they would do these trills, cross string trills, because uh, it was so stunning. I mean, all of, yeah, all of his ornaments was just outstanding, virtuosic. And we would keep rewinding so we could hear the trills, and we were just, it was one of the nerdier things we did. Um, oh yes, Martha asked about Antran, yeah. Um, he's been definitely reaching out to a lot of people about his new recording. Um, John Williams, that would be nice. This is, a, this is definitely a wish list. Um, Pepe Romero, well Donna, you know Pepe. Um, well, maybe Donna, see, Pepe, Pepe is the kind of, you know, maestro that I, I would need an introduction. So if you have, uh, if you wanted to connect us, you'd be very welcome to. But I, there's certain people I try and be respectful and I don't cold call, so to speak. I like to try and have some connection uh, first. Anna, yeah, Anna would be, uh, she's obviously a wonderful player. Jalil, oh yeah. Stephen Gibbs, Stephen Goss? Who's, I don't know Stephen Gibbs. Matthew McAllister, yes. Yeah, he's wonderful. He's been doing a lot of recordings recently. He's putting out sort of a, a piece a day uh, throughout this time. Brandon Acker, yes, he's been doing great. Hans, it sounds like you have Carlo de Manicone. <laughs> yes, there's a funny story with me and Carlo. Um, Brandon Acker, yeah, he has been doing a great job. I haven't seen any videos of late, but he's been doing these videos that get amazing uh, He's got an amazing um, audience on YouTube. I was thinking, I, I would really like to talk to Drew Henderson, wonderful guitarist. Um, and uh, anyway, well, it's some food for thought, so thank you for that. I will bid you a kind farewell. I'll see you in two days. It's going to be a mystery. It could be with Joe Williams. You never know. You never know. Anything can happen. All right, everyone. Uh, take care. Stay well. And I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.